Boys and girls, this is Mr. Manis again with another video. And in this video, we're going to be talking about patterns and predictions and counterexamples and conjectures. And this is a really important video, a very important lesson because there are patterns all around us in the real world. We, you know, we in math class, we talk about what are the next two numbers in the sequence or what's the next shape? I got square, triangle, circle, what's the next shape? But what you're doing is you're training your brain to process and use your critical thinking skills to find the pattern. Now, you're not going to have to find the next shape out in the real world, but what you might have to do is figure out, okay, based on how much production our company's made, how much are we going to produce next year? What are the sales from our company going to be next year? My wife is a the director of Regency Hospice, so she's got to look at how many patients are coming in. Do they need to hire more nurses? Do they, do they need to expand the building? Think about population. Augusta's growing. Is it growing about 10,000 people per year? Is it growing about 50,000 people per year? We're going to have to build more roads. We're going to have to build more schools. We need more police officers, maybe another fire department. They're building a new elementary school right up the road from us because this area of town is getting too big. So this is very, very important stuff that we need to know and be able to predict in the future what's going to happen. So let's start off here with something very, very simple, and that is just looking at some, some numbers here. So I've got these numbers 1, 5, 25, and 125. And they're asking us what are the next two terms in this sequence. So it's simply looking at the numbers and seeing if you can find a pattern. Am I multiplying? Am I dividing? Am I adding some certain number? And I want you guys to pause these videos, uh, pause the video throughout these problems and work them for yourself because it's not just good enough to watch me. I want you to actually think about it and do it. Uh, I love to play chess. There have been times where I've watched a chess video on YouTube and the guy making the video will say, what do you think is the next move? And he'll say, and he'll say, pause the video. I'll give you five seconds to figure out the move. And I love that. I'm like, well, hold on a second. Let me see if I can figure this out on my own. Okay, so I want you guys to be doing that with these problems. Okay, so hopefully you guys have picked up on the fact. What am I doing from one to five? I'm multiplying by five. Five to twenty-five. I'm multiplying by five. Twenty-five to one twenty-five. I'm multiplying by five. So to find the next two terms in the sequence, I'm simply going to multiply one twenty-five by five. And so the next term is going to be 625, excuse me, 625, okay? The next term is going to be 625 times 5, and that's going to give me 3,125, okay? So this would be first term, second term, third term, fourth term, this will be the fifth term, and then that would be the sixth term, okay? So not much to that one, that's pretty straightforward, just recognizing am I adding, am I subtracting, am I multiplying by a number? Let's look at another one. Now this has more to do with actual geometry here where we're looking at shapes and colors. And so they've given us the first three terms or figures. This is figure one, figure two, figure three. And they want us to figure out where do the colors go in figures four and five. Again, so if you want to pause the video for a few seconds, see if you can figure it out on your own. i tell you what I would do on a question like this, guys, is I would focus on one color. Which one do you want to focus on? Yeah, let's go with red. So I look in the first figure, and red is up here at about 10, 11 o'clock. We're looking at a clock. Figure 2 is up here at 12 o'clock. So what have we done from figure 1 to 2? I've started out here in the top left, and all I've done is I've basically gone clockwise, right? I'm going clockwise in this direction. Okay, so the next red triangle is going to be up here in the top middle. And then once again, if I turn the clock, go clockwise again, what am I doing from two to three? I'm going from the top middle to the top right. Okay, So that's pretty easy. So if I'm looking at this pattern here, I'm up here at the top right. Where am I going to be on figure four? I'm going to be one more click, one more turn. I'm going to be down here in the bottom right. So my fourth figure, I'm going to go ahead and just color in red. And yes, I'm going to make you guys watch me color this in exactly. Because that's just the kind of person I am. I love coloring. Color, color with my daughter all the time. Okay. All right. So, do I have another red triangle? No, that's it. I have one, one, one. So, I'm only going to have one red triangle. Now, in the fifth term or the fifth figure, I'm going to go clockwise again. Okay. So, where am I going to be? I'm turning one turn clockwise. So, I'm going to be down here in the bottom middle. So, let's go ahead and shade that in. Okay, 
So that takes care of the red. Okay, so now let's focus on the next color, which is green. Okay, so what's happening up here? I'm in top right. If I turn clockwise, yep, I should be in bottom right. If I turn clockwise again, I should be bottom middle. So if I turn one more, I should be bottom left. And notice, what's the other pattern that you guys notice about the colors? What separates the colors? I should have a white empty triangle that's separating each of the colors. So if I'm here at red, I know both opposite sides of the red have to be blank. So that triangle has to be blank, that triangle has to be blank. Or white, empty, however you want to think about it. So the green one will go here. Okay, one more click clockwise. I'm going from here, I'm going up to the top left. So in figure five, green will be in the top left. Okay, so that takes care of green. And the last one, of course, is yellow. So I'm starting bottom middle, then I go to bottom left, then I go to top left, so the next one should be top middle. But once again, I already knew it had to be top middle because the white empty triangles have to separate each of the colors. Okay, one more click to the right, clockwise. So I'm gonna be here in the top right. Okay, so that finishes up for the patterns here. So once again, you're never going to have to do this in the real world, or probably not, but you're training your brain to figure out, recognize pattern recognition. Life is full of pattern recognition. I don't care if it's a baseball player. Okay, he's batting 200 in April. Now he's batting 250 in May. Now he's batting 270 in June. Well, what do you? what's the pattern? This batter is getting better and better and better as the season goes on. So we're going to make managerial decisions based on that data. Okay, let's go on to conjectures, conjectures. What in the world is a conjecture? A conjecture is a fancy way of saying prediction. Okay, I'm predicting what's going to happen next. I'm concluding that this baseball player is on pace. How many times have you seen that on ESPN? You know, the pitcher has an ERA of this. He's striking out this number of batters. They're saying uh, at this rate, at this pace, he's going to break the Major League Baseball record. Okay, they're predicting what's going to happen in the future. Okay, so let's see what happens when they ask us for certain questions on this pattern. Notice here I have three different colors. Red, or excuse me, green, red, yellow, green, red, yellow, green, red. Okay, but also if I look at the shapes, I have four shapes. I have circle, triangle, square, star. Circle, triangle, square, star. Okay, so let's just focus on one of these at a time. Let's say that they ask us for, let's go with the, I don't know, 27th color. What is the 27th color? Well, yeah, I could sit here and say green, red, yellow, green, red, yellow. I could keep doing that all the way out until I got 27. Man, that's a lot of work. There's an easier way if we find the pattern. The way I do it is I figure out how many different colors do we have. I have green, red, yellow. Green, red, yellow. Green, red, and of course the next one will be yellow. Okay. I have three different colors. So I try to figure out are my the number of terms to divide evenly into what I'm being asked for. Does three divide evenly into 27? Yes, it does. Three goes into 27 nine times. So I know that every third term is a yellow. Three, six, nine, 12, 15, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So since 27 is divisible by three, then the answer is simply yellow. Okay, and that's pretty easy. All right, but let's look at what happens if they ask us for a number that's not evenly divisible. Let's say they're asking us for, let's go with the, um, Let's go with the 37th shape. Okay, now I need to number my shapes. Okay, so I'm going to do this down below. Okay, how many shapes do I have? I have circle, triangle, square, star. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So I have four different shapes. Okay, so now I've got to ask the question, does 4 divide into 37? Because every fourth one is a star. So if it divides evenly, I say, oh, it's just a star. Okay, but it doesn't. Okay, 4 doesn't go into 37. So now I'm thinking, hmm, 
let me see if I can find a number that is really close to 37 that is divisible by 4 and then go from there. So let's, let's instead of using 37, let's go with 36. What is the 36 shape? That's divisible by 4. It goes into it 9 times. So the 36 shape is going to be the star. 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, all the way up to 36. So 36 is equal to star. Okay, but that's not what they asked us for. Okay, so if the 36 is star, what would the 37th be? It would just be the next one in the rotation, in the sequence. So the 37th would be a circle. What if they asked us for the 38th? That would be triangle. 39th would be square. And 40th, now 40 is divisible by 4, so again, 40th would be the star. Uh, and you don't have to start with the one below it. I could do the one above it. Let's go with 40. 40 is close to 37, and it's divisible by 4. And we already said the 40th is what? Is the star. Okay. But 40th is a, a little bit away from 37. So in this case, if I pick the number above, I could just go backwards. I could say, okay, 40th is star, 39th is square, 38th is triangle, so 37th would be, once again, we get circle. So notice it doesn't matter whether I start with a number that's a little bit above it or a little bit, of, um, a little bit above it or a little bit below it. You just either have to, have to count forwards or count backwards. Okay. So that is conjecture problem number one. Now we're going to look at conjecture problem number two and three. Okay. They are asking us, I want to make, make a prediction. What is the sum of the first 40 odd numbers? Okay. Hmm. Well, you can do this manually, but man, that's going to take a lot of work to get all the way up to 40. A lot of times with these conjectures, it's better to make yourself a little table. Okay, so let's make ourselves let's make ourselves a table. Actually, you know what? I'm going to make that table much bigger. That's probably not enough room. That was a little bit of magic there. Let's, let's extend it out over here. We'll need a little bit more room. Okay, so let's break it down into the first odd number. What's the first odd number? Okay, that's just one. What about the second odd number? If I'm adding the odd numbers, I'm going to be adding 1 plus the next odd number, which is 1 plus 3. That equals 4. Okay, probably haven't seen the pattern yet. What about the first three odd numbers? I'm going to be adding 1 plus 3 plus 5. That's 8 plus 1. That's going to be 9. Now you guys hopefully can start to see the pattern. What about the sum of the first four odd numbers? 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7. Basically, I'm just adding 7 to this previous number. So 9 plus 7 is 16. Ooh, I hope you guys can see the pattern here. 1, 4, 9, 16. If you don't see the pattern yet, pause the video and see if you can figure out what the pattern is. Okay, so hopefully you guys saw, oh, wait a minute. These are the perfect squares. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, and 4 squared is 16. Okay, so all I have to do is, if I want the sum of the first 40 odd numbers, is I just need to square 40. 40 times 40, 1600. Okay, 4 times 4 is 16, I have two zeros, 1600. Okay, what about the product of two odd numbers? So let's check that out for a minute. Okay, there's no right or wrong way to start here. Let me just start with some easy odd numbers. What is 1 times 3? That's 3. What about 5 times 7? 35. What about, um, what about 9 times, uh, let's go 9 times 5. That's 45. What about 7 times 3? That's 21. Hmm. What's 1 times 17? That's 17. You guys see a pattern? What do you notice about all these final answers? What's so special about these numbers? You want to pause the video? Hopefully you saw, wait a minute, these are all odd numbers. Every single one of them. No matter what two odd numbers I multiply times each other, I will always get an odd number. So our conjecture is, the answer is, you will always get 
an odd number as your answer. So up here we got 1600, down here we are using our conjecture to make a conclusion that any two odd numbers multiplied together will give you an odd number answer. Okay. So that's conjecture. All right, so let's keep on going over now to predictions, predictions. Man, I love this example. I love it, love it, love it. Real world stuff, guys. If any of you guys have parents that have ever bought and sold stock or maybe invest in mutual funds for their retirement account or whatever, this is as real world as it gets. I've got a, a chart here of a, the price of a stock. It could be Microsoft stock, Apple stock, whatever, Best Buy stock. And I'm looking at this graph and I'm looking at the picture. I've got the cost over here for the price of the stock. $5 per share, $20 per share, $30 per share. Down here I have time. And hopefully you guys have learned in math by now, time is always on the x-axis. You can't control time. It's always the independent variable. It's going with or without you. Okay, And the, in, the dependent variable goes on the y-axis. Okay, So I'm trying to look at this graph and try to get a feel for how much is the stock going, it's obviously going up, but how much is it going up by every month? Remember we did the backpack sales problem in class where we were saying, okay, the number of backpacks sold is dropping by 500 every month and we're trying to figure out what happens in that last month. It's the same thing here with, with the stock, okay? So let's take a look here. In the first, in, in January, it looks like the stock is about, the increment is five, so it's starting about $4 per share. And between January and February, it looks like it goes up to exactly 10. So that's an increase. That's an increase of about six. Okay, from February to March, it went from 10 to 15. Okay, so that's an increase of about five. From March to April, it's going from 15. That looks like it's about 18. So that's only plus three. So you can see the graph is getting a little flatter. And then from April to May, it's going steep again. I'm going from 18 up to, it looks like about 24. So that's about plus 6. So if I were to take the average of all of these, okay, 6 plus 5, that's 11, plus 3 is 14, plus 6 is 20, divided by 4 months. On average, how much is the stock rising per month? Well, 20 divided by 4 is 5. So on average, I would say this stock is going up by about $5 a share. So now I want to make a, a prediction. Do I want to buy this stock? Well, heck yeah, I do, man. This thing's going up. How much? How much money would I expect, reasonably expect to make if I bought this stock? Well, it's going up by $5 a share from May to June. It should, we, a reasonable person would expect this to also go up by about $5 a share. Okay, so this would be plus five. So if we're sitting here at $24 per share and I add five to that, then in June, I would reasonably expect the price of the stock to be 24 plus five, which is $29 a share. Okay, that's reasonable. Now this is a stock. This could be iPad sold. This could be the amount of production my company makes. This could be the number of patients that a hospital takes in. This could be anything, guys. It's just about recognizing patterns. I used to do this all the time every week when I was an uh, environmental manager. We would look at the amount of wastewater discharged to the river and we would have some cap. Let me do this in, in blue. I would, I would have some kind of permit limit on what my company can discharge to the Savannah River for ammonia, urea, pH, all this kind of wastewater parameter stuff, okay? And if we exceeded this limit at the end of the month, then we would be fined tens of thousands of dollars. So that's a big no-no. So my boss would come in during the middle of the month, and he would say, Mr. Meese, how we doing? Does it look like we're going to be okay, or does it look like we're in trouble? And I'd have to look at the data and say, boss, uh, at this rate, at this increase, we're going to be above the limit. And he says, okay, go fix it. So I have to go out in the plant. I have to take water samples, figuring out why the numbers are high. Maybe it was a valve left open. Maybe a tank's leaking or whatever. And I have to fix the leak and stop the problem. But I used to do this kind of stuff all the time. It's about pattern recognition. Okay. All right, so that's just an example with a chart. Let's look at an example with a table. So I would love for you guys to send me an email, write me a letter when you graduate from college and get out in the real world and tell me, Mr. Moniz, I actually had to count the number of chirps uh, from crickets. Okay, so I'm sure there are probably people out there that actually do this. If you hear 20 cricket chirps in 14 seconds, make a prediction of what the temperature will be at that point. Okay, so let's look at our chart. This is the number of chirps from the crickets per 14 seconds. So in the first 14 seconds, 
Okay, so in the I have five chirps in the first 14 seconds with a temperature of 45 degrees. In the next 14 seconds, after 28 seconds, I'm going to hear, hear 10 chirps. That's being affected. The temperature, the chirps are being affected by the temperature. So after 28 seconds, I have 55 degrees, 10 chirps, and then after another 14, what's that? 42. After 42 seconds, I hear 15 chirps, and the temperature is rising up to 65 degrees. So what the question is asking us, if you hear 20 chirps, what do you think the temperature would be? Well, I'm following the pattern here. I'm just going up by 5 every time. What do you notice about the pattern of the temperature? What's happening from here to here? Well, I went up 10 degrees. What's happening from here to here? Well, I went up 10 degrees. So what would you reasonably con conclude would happen after another 14 seconds with 20 chirps? I would expect the temperature to be 75 degrees, another 10 degrees. Okay, so that takes us through predictions. I've got one last thing we need to cover in this section, and that is on counterexamples. What is a counterexample? A counterexample is when somebody makes a statement and you say, uh-uh-uh, no, 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 no. I've got an example that disproves what you're telling me. Okay, so uh, again, a counterexample just is, is a way of saying, no, 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 no. I've got an example that I can give you that doesn't fit what you're trying to tell me. So let's look at the first example. Someone says, someone, one of your friends in class says, the sum of two numbers is always greater than either number. So to find a counterexample, I've got to figure out an example that doesn't fit this, that, where I can say, no, 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 hold on, i got an example that doesn't work. See what you guys can come up with. Well, let's, let's make some, let's go ahead and try it out. Try it out a couple times. If I add 2 plus 6... Is that answer greater than both 6 and 2? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that works. What if I add uh, 0 plus 27? <clears throat> Is that greater than both numbers? Whoa, no sir. No sir, that doesn't work. 27 is not greater than 27. 27 equals 27. What if I threw a negative in there? Negative 2 plus 3. What does that equal? 1. Is 1 greater than both of the numbers? Well, it's greater than negative 2. Yeah, that's true. But 1 is not greater than 3. No, sir. That doesn't work. So both of these examples would be counterexamples to this statement. Okay. What about this crazy example? All college football teams are bad. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's pretty true. I mean, you got, you know, South Carolina Gamecocks. They're bad. You got Georgia Bulldogs. They're terribly bad. I mean, Ohio State. They're terrible. I can actually think of several college football teams that are actually very, very good at football. I, one right off the bat would be Clemson. No, they're, they're really good. Oh, you got this football team. You got the University of Clemson. That's another, that's another school that's got a really good football team. You got this guy, the football team that this guy represents. You know, that's a very, really good football team. That's a, that's a good one. That one is the, the Clemson Tigers. So all three of these will be absolutely great counterexamples to this statement. All football, college football teams are bad. Uh-uh-uh. You got Clemson, you got the University of Clemson, and you got the Clemson Tigers. All three of those teams are really good. All math teachers are bad. All math teachers are bad. What would be a counterexample to that? Can you think of a math teacher that who isn't who isn't bad, who is really, really good? Oh, y'all are so sweet. Y'all are so sweet. I love you guys to death. Mr. Manis, counterexample? Okay. Hope you guys enjoyed that video. This is it, and we will see you on the next one.